Dear colleagues, I'm Maggie Shaheen, orthopedic surgeon and adult articular reconstruction film at Maison Nab Osman Hospital in Montreal, Canada. I will review with you the native knee collateral ligament laxity and balance. We are also going to explore new avenues to restore or preserve the patient's native ligament tension during total knee replacement. Always that change involves uncertainty. After successfully overcoming the issue of implant longevity, we now face the challenge to reproduce patient knee function. Residual instability after total knee arthroplasty is now considered the second most common cause of revision surgery. During this webinar, we review the most up-to-date scientific data on normal collateral ligament tension and laxities. Then we will see what are the clinical effects of collateral ligament laxity on modification of total knee arthroplasty clinical results. Lastly, we will try to determine if there is a better surgical technique to replicate native ligament function. It's important to understand normal knee anatomy kinematics. The medial collateral ligament has two components, superficial and deep. The femoral attachment of the superficial component is 3 mm proximal and 5 mm posterior to the medial epicondyle. The tibial attachment lies deep and posterior to the pis and serenus. The deep component attached 17 mm to the femoral articular cartilage, and it's about 7 mm from the tibial articular cartilage. The superficial component is the primary valgus stabilizer. It also limits tibial external rotation and anteroposterior translation. Regarding the deep component, previous studies reported contradictory results of its role in knee, knee stability. However, these studies were performed without intact tendons and ligament structure around the knee joint. For many surgeons, releasing the tibial insertion of deep MCL during total knee arthroplasty is part of their standard exposure. Here are two different studies found that its release resulted in rotational instabilities at different flexion angles. Ligament tension during the arc of motion depends on the attachment zone of, lig of the ligaments, changing the fiber's length, and the shape of the articular surfaces. A kinematic testing and 3D motion analysis of cadaveric knee specimen by Gardner et al. revealed that anterior superficial bundle of MCL remains tight during flexion, and its posterior fibers tightens at knee extension. Also, Briscrova et al. reported that in full extension, the femoral condyles moves on the tibial anterior facet, increasing the medial gap and consequently the MCL tensions, which explains why we can look our knee tightly in full extension. With some flexion, the femoral condyle moves to a deep portion of the tibial plateau concavity, so MCL loosen. With deeper flexion, there is a slight posterior translation of the condyle and change in the radius of the curvature, which further reduces the MCL tension. When we look at the LCL anatomy, proximally it is attached 3 mm posterior and 1.5 mm proximal to the lateral epicondyle and distally it's attached to the anterolateral side of the fibular head. It prevents various injuries at 5 and 30 degrees of flexion. Also, it adds stability to the posterior lateral rotation before 50 degrees of flexion. Anatomical studies have shown that the distance between fibular and femoral attachment decreases flexion. At full extension, the lateral collateral ligament is tight. As the knee flexes, there is a backward motion of the lateral femoral condyle. The lateral collateral ligament becomes vertical with flexion up to 90 degrees. The ligament becomes visibly slack. With flexion to 120 degrees, the femoral condyle drops as it rolls over the posterior round surface of the tibia, which further relaxes the lateral collateral ligament. Reviewing the literature, several studies have evaluated the tension of the collateral ligament in the arc of motion of normal knees, where they have used different protocols and methods to assess the ligament behavior. This is a very busy slide. Let's see what is the important findings. From all these studies, we can conclude that Tension of the collateral ligament is subjected to individual variability. There is more laxity in females. They are not isometric throughout the arc of motion. MCL is tighter than LCL, and they are both tight in extension than in flexion. The difference between MCL and LCL tension while moving from extension to flexion and geometry of the joint surface results in medial pivot kinematics, where the medial femoral condyle remains almost stationary over an almost congruent medial tibial plateau, while the lateral femoral condyle rotates externally and moves from anterior to posterior over the almost flat lateral tibial plateau. The difference in ligament laxity and the rotatory mo movement during flexion also affect the patellofemoral kinematics. The internal tibial rotation will move the tibial tubercle anteriorly and medially, 
resulting in reduced patellar pressure. This reveals that femoro-tibial and patellofemoral joint kinematics are closely related. In fact, not restoring this medial pivot kinematic during total knee arthroplasty negatively affects the patellofemoral joint. By understanding the native laxity of collateral ligaments, we can avoid undesirable outcomes following total knee arthroplasty, will allow improvement of implant designs and surgical techniques to better restore or preserve the tension of the native ligaments. Here are two examples. The mobile bearing insert was an interesting idea to reduce the stresses at the bone cement interface. However, it doesn't replicate the normal knee kinematics, as one side moves backward while the other moves forward. A medial pivot knee design seems much more appropriate. Another example is switching from multi-radius femoral components designs to more anatomical components. Well, there are two key benefits to single radius knees and their implications are pretty important. In contrast to single radius designs, multi-radius designs are flat at mid-flexion, which loosens the collateral ligaments creating mid-flexion instability. As a consequence, patients have difficulty getting up from chairs or climbing stairs. Unfortunately, these designs were based on two-dimensional analysis of the knee joint in lateral view. Now we'll try to answer our second question. Is there a correlation between clinical results and ligament stability? When trying to align the knee using the mechanical axis as a reference, failure to balance the soft tissue envelope to obtain a rectangular flexion and extension gap will lead to instability, which considered as the second most common cause of revision after total knee arthroplasty. In those cases requiring revision, we're talking about marked instability. On the other hand, persistent pain, joint stiffness, accelerated wear have all been associated with over-tensioning of collateral ligaments. More subtle imbalances may also be linked to unsatisfactory outcomes. Intraoperative ligament tension is usually judged subjectively. Using pressure sensor to assess intraoperative compartment pressure differences showed that balanced total knee arthroplasty had better knee society score and WOMAX score compared to those considered non-balanced. There is a great variability in literature regarding the effect of residual Im ligament imbalances on the clinical outcomes after total knee arthroplasty. In an interesting study, reported that better clinical scores were achieved when mediolateral gap differences was less than three millimeters. Studying the relation between postoperative knee stability and patient satisfaction, medial stability and lateral laxity were found to have significant correlation with higher patient satisfaction and better clinical scores at short-term follow-up. This interesting finding takes us back to normal collateral ligament tension, where the medial collateral ligament is tighter than the lateral collateral ligament. Thus, restoring the native collateral balance and tension should be our pursuit aimed, rather than trying to obtain ligament isometry. So far, we don't know what is the acceptable mediolateral gap differences. Yet, it's very important to restore normal knee balance and avoid instability that is linked to patient dissatisfaction and complications. The current gold standard alignment for total knee arthroplasty is a mechanical alignment technique described by Freeman in 1973. The goal is to systematically perform neutral femoral and tibial cuts to obtain neutral hip knee ankle angle. However, is this the patient native alignment? Let us look at the patient natural alignment. After evaluating 4,800 CT scans of patients scheduled for total knee arthroplasty, we found that the mean hip knee ankle angle was 0.1 degree very near to the mechanical alignment goal, but only 4% had proximal tibia at zero degrees, and 5% had distal femur at zero degrees, and only 0.1% had both proximal tibia and distal femur at zero degrees. We can conclude that systemic putting the limb in neutral alignment replicates only 0.1% of human anatomy. The mean anatomical modification with mechanical alignment on distal femur and proximal tibia were very near to three degrees. However, there was a wide range on both sides. These extremes anatomical changes may be the problematic cases. Simulating the mechanical alignment bore resection on thousand lower limb CT scans for patients undergoing patient-specific instruments total knee arthroplasty might have created an extension gap imbalances of more than five millimeter in 7% of varus knees and in 18% of valgus knees. Surgeons must not be able to correct these imba imbalances and consequently end up by instability. Also, systemic cutting the proximal tibia perpendicular to its long axis, ignoring the patient native anatomy, creates a trapezoidal flexion gap that requires further non-anatomical correction by externally rotating the femoral component and over-resecting the posterior medial condyle, which creates patellofemoral problems. Actually, we're trying to, pre to create a preset goal, which is the rectangular gap. However, 
the latter compartment behaves differently. Here again, the same study simulating the mechanical ion bore resections for flexion space using the trans epicondylar axis or systemic three degrees of external rotation were linked to significant flexion gap imbalances of more than three millimeters and up to 60% of valgus knees. Now we'll move to our third question. Is there a better surgical technique to achieve ligament balance and knee stability? As shown by these studies, whatever the technique we use to perform mechanical alignment, the anatomical changes resulting from the predefined goal of neutral, femoral, and tibial cuts are related to instability. Several least techniques were described to correct the knee imbalances created by mechanical alignment. During many years, experts spent time writing papers and book chapters describing different ways to solve their problems. Can we correct ligament imbalance created by mechanical alignment? Without special instruments, the surgeon perception of balance depend on surgical training, experience, and skills, but emphasized by patient factors like BMI, gender, or comorbidities. Precision tools such as computer navigation may be helpful. Regarding the technique of release, many reports suggested that it's unpredictable and may result in over-release and instability. Precision tools introduced assuming a better mechanical alignment would lead to better clinical outcomes. Though the use of precision tools in mechanical knee alignment has improved the gap balancing up to less than three millimeter difference with computer navigation gap balancer in about 90% of cases, they did not restore the pre-disease ligament balance. Using standard instruments, our precision is weak. And as on the left X-ray and target, we often perform, we are missing the target by lacking of precision. On the right side, using precision tools like computer navigation or robot, we are very precise but we're missing the target. We're not accurate. Simply, we are using the technology advances to achieve a wrong target. That's why using a precision tool to achieve mechanical alignment goal did not improve our patient outcomes. From the modern knowledge on human knee anatomy and knee native ligament laxes, we should rethink our total knee arthroplasty surgical techniques. Anatomical reconstructions aim to restore native individual anatomy and reproduce normal ligament laxes and knee biomechanics. In other words, aiming for right target. One option is the kinematic alignment technique. Kinematic alignment is a true knee resurfacing of the joint surfaces. We are replacing the resected bone and cartilage with an implant of the same thickness, following the patient-specific pre-arthritic anatomy, not keeping the limb in virus. Kinematic alignment restores the pre-arthritic condition, starting from the femur, compensating cartilage wear to reference the native joint line, and cutting exactly the implant thickness of the two condyles, both distally and posteriorly, which resurfaces the femur and aligns the component to the cylindrical axis. Once the femoral preparation is completed and the implant is positioned on the bone, the native femoral articular surface is restored. Every step can be verified by measuring the resected bone. On the unworn side, this equal the implant thickness minus one millimeter of the saw blade curve. On the worn side, another two millimeter of missing cartilage should be considered and subtracted. The same technique is applied to the tibia. Cartilage wear is compensated on the worn side to align the component to the native joint line. Asymmetric cut is performed on the median lateral side, restoring the native slope and cutting exactly the implant thickness. Once the tibial component is in place, the native tibial articular surface is restored. When restricted kinematic alignment protocol was simulated on 1,000 CT scan, a significantly less frequent gap imbalances were encountered compared to mechanical alignment. More than 90% of knees had mediolateral extension gap difference of less than 2 millimeters, and more than 90% of knees had mediolateral flexion gap difference of less than 2 millimeters. Similar results were found by McDissey in Australia, in the randomized control trial, they assessed the, the intraoperative imbalances using pressure sensor for mechanical alignment and restricted kinematic alignment cases. All total knee arthroplasty were implanted using, using computer-assisted navigation. Only 35% of mechanical alignment cases were found balanced at 10 degrees of flexion versus 80% of restricted kinematic alignment cases. In summary, kinematic alignment, avoid ligament release, maintain na native ligament laxity, it's true resurfacing by restoring joint surfaces that are exactly equal to those that have been removed. But the most important, is there a proof that these benefits translate to improved clinical outcomes? Significantly better patient reported outcome measure were found in four randomized trials, and they were equal in another two trials. Very promising results. 
So going back to our three questions, here are important points to remember. Collateral ligament lacks to, there is high individual variability. They're not isometric. Medial collateral ligament is tighter than the lateral collateral ligament. Soft tissue laxatives play an important role in knee kinematics. As regard to the clinical results, residual instability is linked to the inferior clinical outcomes. Restoring native ligament balance improves patient's function. And as regard to the surgical technique, it's important to revisit our alignment technique to preserve the native patient's specific anatomy and to restore original ligament laxatives. I also invite you to visit the personalized arthroplasty website where you will find interesting content on modern ways to perform hip and knee joint replacement. You can also download for free the personalized hip and knee joint replacement textbook. Thank you for your attention.